Well, good morning. Good to be here. A privilege indeed. Lovely to see so many of you out to worship the Lord and to turn our eyes upon Jesus. No greater place um, to do that and no greater person to put your eyes upon. And when you do, the things of this world, the worries of this world, the cares of this world, the dramas of this world do indeed grow dim. Well, we, we come again now to our journey through the Gospel of Mark. Mark is an evangelistic gospel. It is the evangelistic gospel. And what is so wonderful about the journey through any book of the Bible is that we are, by God's sovereign hand, at His appointed time, in His appointed moment, going through His text for us. He speaks to us, every word is inerrant, and every word is inspired, and therefore every word is to be preached. And so it is our joy and our privilege to gather around this evangelistic gospel. And the title of the message this morning is The Weightiest of Words. And I believe that our portion that we'll look at this morning as we journey through are exactly that. And so turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. If you are visiting with us this morning, we work our way verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark at the moment, and so we'll pick up in verse 34 in Mark chapter 8. And He summoned the crowd with His disciples and said to them, this is Jesus speaking, if anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of Him when He comes in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. Let's pray. Father, we come before You having read the weightiest of words. Father, would you help me, your servant, sinful as I am, in great need of you, I certainly am. I cannot do this without you, I need your help. And Lord, each and every one of us, we need your help. Lord, help us to appropriate what we hear. Father, would you do a mighty work of salvation and sanctification? Lord, we believe in the Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Two questions. You feel the weight of these words? People face a Christless eternity, and that's just a way of saying they face an eternity in hell. For their rejection of the most precious person that has ever been sent to this world, the greatest gift that has ever been given to this world, the person of Jesus Christ. Two questions. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? The words that we've just read are sobering and significant words. Not startling as though you've never heard them before. Because for most of you, you will have heard them before. Some of you will not have heard them before. But for all of us here this morning, whether we've heard these words before or whether we have never heard them ever before in our life, it will be the reality and the riches of them that will give each of us an unmistakable knowledge of what it means to live 
for Jesus Christ. To be a follower, a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus had just had that traveling talk with the twelve that we saw last Sunday, where Peter had made that great confession, you are the Christ, when Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? And now Jesus here in verses 34 to 38, which will be our focus this morning, Jesus seizes the moment. What moment? Well, let me explain. The, the first part of Mark, that is the first eight chapters where we're, we're up to, has been all about the arrival of Jesus, the teachings and healings of Jesus, the calling of a very small group of men by Jesus, namely the twelve, that He called to follow Him, that He would tell them to follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And then to the summoning of those twelve and the sending out of those twelve, it's all been thus far about Jesus going about the place, calling people to follow Him. And then with the confession by Peter that we saw last week where he accurately identified that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the, the, the long-awaited Messiah, that He is indeed the Savior for His people and He is establishing His kingdom. On the back of all of that, Jesus then says, look, now I'm going to transition from going out into this region and into that region because I'm making a V-line for Jerusalem. I've set my face like a flint towards Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, Jesus says, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be rejected, and I'm going to be crucified. And then three days later, I am going to rise again. And so I have called you to follow me, he says. But now, and in our passage this morning, now I'm going to show you what it looks like to follow me. And I'm going to tell you and everyone in this crowd what is required to be my disciple. And so that is what we're going to feel the full weight of today. We so desperately need to hear these words and their meaning. And so in our passage this morning, we'll see three components of these weighty words that will serve us to see what it truly means to be a genuine disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give you some headings of which you can hang your thoughts on. I've taken a leaf, leaf out of Dr. Alan Kans's book with this outline and I've adapted his. Number one, I want us to see in verse 34 a pattern. In verses 35 to 37, I want us to see a paradox. And then lastly, in verse 38, we'll see a penalty. So very, quite simply, a pattern, a paradox, and a penalty. And so let's begin. I want you to see very clearly, number one, a pattern in verse 34. Jesus summoned the crowd with His disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You recall in our passage previously, Jesus had just told the twelve that He would go to the cross. We saw how startling that was because the view of the day was that the Messiah would usher in by military might a type of utopia, overthrow the Romans, and all would be well instantly there on earth. But Jesus told them that He would suffer. And He used the term the Son of Man, you recall. And we saw the significance of that from Daniel. And so Jesus has told them that He would go to the cross, and the significance of Him telling them that He would go to the cross is that before King Jesus receives His crown, there is a cross. And now here Jesus tells, and I want you to note that Jesus tells both the crowd and the twelve that there was a cross for Him, but He tells us now in verse 34 that there is a cross for you, the follower. Jesus is telling everyone within earshot and everyone since 
that has seen these words with their eyes. Jesus is telling everyone, the crowd, the twelve, you and I, that a suffering Messiah has suffering followers. That there is a cross for Him and that there is a cross for you and I. That He will suffer and so will we. Jesus, by these words in verse 34, is presenting a pattern, a pattern of requirements. Requirements either to conversion for the crowd or to greater commitment to the disciples and the twelve. And I say all that because, as I said, I want you to see that Jesus here in verse 34 is saying the one thing to three types of people. The beginning of verse 34. He summoned the crowd, the general populace, and His disciples, His closest disciple is. And included in that group is the crowd of the public, and then in the twelve are those that are converted, and we know that there is the counterfeit. Judas. And so, Jesus is saying this to the crowd, that is the people, to the converted, that is the twelve, and to the counterfeit, Judas. This radical call by Jesus that day went out to the crowd, to the converted, and to the counterfeit. And this morning, as we read His words, and His words go out, I think if we're honest, They go out to the same group. For many of us here, we're indeed converted. These words are for you and for I. There would certainly be some of us here that are just part of the crowd. You just wandered in, came here with a friend or your family, and you're just part of the crowd. You're here because you're just looking in and having a look at what's going on as you pass by. Well, out of the compassionate heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, these words are for you too. And sadly, though certainly, there are some here, and you are counterfeit, false, in your profession, in your conversion, and you'll be just like those who Jesus said on that last day, many will come to me, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. So there is a crowd here, there are the converted here, and there is the counterfeit here. It was the same when Jesus summoned that crowd and those disciples and He said these things, and it's the same now when He says these things. These words are weighty. These words are radical. These words are from the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that moment back then and for this moment right now, Jesus speaks these words in the hope that they bring about conversion to those among the crowd and those who are counterfeit. And they bring about greater commitment for the converted and those that have been found. For the twelve, they'd already followed and heard the call to follow Jesus. And now here they were hearing these words from Jesus now, aware of themselves that they'd already done what Jesus had said, that is, they had forsaken their families, they had forsaken their careers, but now they were being urged to press on. They were fully convinced and that now they were being fully confirmed that what they had already done, what they had already begun to do, they must continue to do. That's for the twelve. For the crowd, they're hearing... The call to follow Jesus. Jesus says there, if anyone wishes to come after me, that is to say, if anyone wishes to have a saving relationship with me, here are three things that must be true of you. I want to show you those three things. But before we do, I want to explain something. 
the whole concept of coming after Jesus. In, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, we see that to come after Jesus is to come to Jesus. And to come to Jesus is to come to saving faith in Jesus. And so if anyone wants to come to saving faith in Jesus, there are three requirements given by Jesus here in verse 34. They serve as this pattern that is presented by Jesus for genuine discipleship. Three requirements. Number one, Jesus says there, he must deny himself. Number one, self-denial. If anyone wishes to come after me, number one, he must deny himself. If you're going to be a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to turn away from the fulfilling of self. Jesus is saying here, self can no longer rule and no longer reign. The self can no longer determine and drive. The self can no longer be on the throne. Self can no longer be the main player in the game. The self can no longer be, Jesus is saying, your savior. There is, Jesus is saying, only room in your heart and mind for one. One master. And that master must no longer be self. You ask, well, how is self the king and master of my life? Well, prior to coming to Jesus Christ, there is one big, great idol that you carry about the place wherever you go. It determines where you go. This one great big idol that you carry about determines what you do. It determines who you are. It determines who you love. It determines who you hate, what you love and what you hate. It determines what you devote yourself to. And that great big idol is your will. Your will. And because of your will, and the fact that self is king, prior to coming to Jesus Christ in saving faith, you are a self-willed person, and what self says goes... But what Jesus is calling for is for self to go. An all-consuming focus on serving self it must be exchanged for an all-consuming focus on serving Christ and serving others. And for the unconverted, self is king. And the, therefore, Jesus is not king. Jesus is not whom you worship. And so this is a call here right up front, a call to abandon the idolatry and obsession with self. To lay aside self and begin to deny yourself and to not allow self to be on the throne. And for this, there's a call here to those that are lost. For the converted, this is a call to deeper commitment to sacrificial service to Christ and to others. And, and, and in that regard, there are some biblical examples that can really shed light on this for us. You don't have to turn there, but just listen to this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 23, it says this, Paul wrote, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may also be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Paul says this, for I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for, Paul says, they all seek after their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel, like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him to you immediately. Timothy was one who modeled self-denial in the life of a disciple. Timothy had one aim, one desire, one objective, and that was to serve Christ and to put self last. Paul knew of no one else. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus and Christ. 
So, a call for greater commitment to the converted. To those in the crowd, a call to abandon self and flee to the Saviour. And certainly, this self-denial includes any claim to any salvation due to anything that self has done to an attempt to be made right with God. Every false religion in the world, every unconverted person in the world, all they try and do is to make self, make any attempt to be made right with God, a self-based, self-work, self-righteous religion. That's the default condition of all people outside of faith in Jesus Christ, trying to make self right before God by self-effort. But the gospel says, there is not a single thing that self can do to be made right with God. Nothing. Instead, the gospel calls you to abandon any self-effort and rely completely upon the work of someone else, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the first requirement, he must deny himself. The self-denial includes a turning away from sin and to trust no longer in self but the Savior, to sever from self and the sin that defined you and to flee to Christ and be joined to Him. And so this first requirement is a requirement to turn away from sin. And when you've done that, and when you've laid aside any supposed self-rights that you think you may have, or self-entitlement that you think you deserve, where when you have abandoned any notion of self, turned away from your sin, then you have truly submitted your life to Christ. And so number one, self must be off the throne. Self so consistently and commonly crawls back onto the throne, does it not? How unfortunate that is when we become self-willed, when we who have been severed from the old self and put on the new self, as a result of our flesh, we allow our sinful self to crawl black and to be king. If you sit here unconverted this morning, you must deny yourself, turn away from your sin and follow after Jesus Christ. That's the first requirement that begins to form the pattern that Jesus is presenting here for what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Number one, self-denial. Next we see number two, suffering. It says there, next, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must take up his cross suffering. There was a cross for Christ, and there's a cross for all followers of Jesus Christ. The cross was the single most horrendous form of death at the time here. In fact, capital punishment today, nations that are bold enough, brave enough, and biblical enough to still use that, the cross pales in significance. Those things pale in significance to the ruggedness of death upon a cross. Ghastly and terrifying was it when a criminal was nailed to a cross of wood. To die by the cross meant that you had been tried under Roman law, found guilty of the punishment of death by that law, and you were then made to carry your own cross to the site where you would be crucified. This is exactly what happened to Jesus, was it not? After being beaten and mocked and scorned, He was made to carry His cross and the road from where He was tried under Roman law as a criminal. He had to carry that cross then to Calvary's hill where He would be crucified. And the name of that road is called the Via Della Rosa. It's some 600 meters long. And it winds up the hill to Golgotha there, the place of the skull where they crucified him. And so Jesus, remember here, he, he, not having yet even been there himself, is drawing upon that imagery and saying that if you want to follow me, there not only must be denial of self in whatever way self is made evident, self-rights, self-entitlement, self-vindication, self-righteousness, whatever it may be. 
there must also be a willingness to suffer. To suffer. That is what it means here by taking up your cross, by cross-bearing. It has been, according to Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, which says, it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Two gifts by God. Number one, salvation. And number two, suffering. You want to follow Jesus? You've got to suffer. It's the reality of it. Oh, how contrary these things are from common modern evangelism and common preaching in the world today. Jesus is radical in His call to follow Him. The suffering Messiah has suffering followers. And when we share in His name, we share in His sufferings. And part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ is to suffer Look, there may be roads, there is roads paved with gold and walls made of jasper in heaven that await those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. But while we make our pilgrimage to our eternal home, our paths here on earth are just like our Lord's were here on earth. They are marked with suffering. And please note that while... Life is certainly filled with God-ordained times of sorrow and grief and loss and difficulty. What Jesus is talking about here, about taking up your cross, is not talking about some irritation or some annoyance or some sorrow or burden that we bear. This is specifically talking about the willingness to suffer for Jesus' sake, the willingness to stand for Christ, for the truth of Christ. And instead of seeking self justification and self-rights and a demand to vindication, which would be the very opposite of what Christ did, right? The very one who had the rights to demand his own rights and demand his own vindication went to the cross without ever doing those things. The willingness to stand for Christ is the willingness to carry your cross and it's to suffer loss whether it be the loss of your own life for the brothers and sisters that live outside of this world, or one day when it falls upon New Zealand, who knows? The willingness to suffer the loss of your own reputation for Christ's sake. This is what it means to, su- to carry your cross. It is for Christ's sake. It is to walk a path of suffering and a path of slander and mistreatment and heartache, and even martyrdom for the sake of Jesus Christ. It's been well said that not every believer will die a martyr's death. I mean, there isn't many in New Zealand who die a martyr's death, right? There's many in other parts of the world who die a a martyr's death. But the point is this, but every faithful believer, it's been well said, loves Christ so much that dying at the hands of wicked men is not too high a price to pay. That if you were to go somewhere or be somewhere and death, a martyr's death was your reality, you would confess Jesus as Lord, they would martyr you and you would be absent from the body and present with the Lord. To carry a cross is to be mocked and mistreated by the world. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 18 through to 21, if the world hates you, translated since the world hates you, you know that it has hated hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Jesus said, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So to carry your cross is to endure hardship as a good soldier. It is to endure suffering and to share in the sufferings of Christ. 
Sometimes we have this idea that Christianity is this romantic thing. No, 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 it's a suffering thing. 1 John 2, 2 chapter 6 says, The one who says he abides in him ought also himself to walk in the same manner as Jesus walked. And to walk like he walked is to carry your own cross as you walk this life. In Luke's account, he uses the word daily. Daily. This is to be a day by day, carrying and bearing and taking up a cross and suffering and sharing in those sufferings of Christ. That's the second requirement of what it means to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. First, you must deny yourself. The second, you must suffer and be willing to suffer for Christ's sake. The third requirement we see there that forms the pattern that Jesus is presenting here for true and genuine discipleship is number three, submissive obedience. When Jesus says, and follow me, it's a call to submissive obedience. Obedience. This is what it means to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus is to obey all that Jesus says. Willingly, eagerly, submissively. And for the counterfeit here this morning, this is where you are undone. Because you live like Jesus never gave you a law to obey, all while confessing that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus will say to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But for the follower of Jesus Christ, we must be obedient to Jesus Christ. And for the one who is, sits here unconverted this morning, the way in which you follow Jesus is to obey Jesus, to put your faith in Jesus. We prove our genuineness by our obedience. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31, if you continue in my word... That is, if you obey my word, he says, you truly are my disciples, indeed. This is a command here to follow me, Jesus says. It's in the present tense, which meaning it speaks of a continual act. But by living a life day by day of obedience, a life marked by the repentance of sin, a turning away from sin, it is made evident that you are a disciple of Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, a life of enduring ob obedience is a key indicator of the validity of saving faith. And so, from verse 34, genuine conversion, genuine discipleship is marked by self-denial. It's marked by suffering. And it's marked by submissive obedience to Christ's commands. I want you to know something very clearly. And it's important to point it out at this point. We are not saved by how well we follow Jesus. Does that make sense? There is no saving merit in how good we follow we don't believe in a works-based salvation. That is for every other false religion in the world. We believe in divine accomplishment, that someone else accomplished everything on our behalf, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sinners and we can never follow perfectly. What Jesus is teaching us here is that when you are saved by putting your faith in Christ, you will follow according to this pattern that He gives us. This will be what marks you. You will sever from self. You will suffer for Him. And you will surely obey Him. That's the pattern from Jesus. Now I want you to see the next component of these weighty words that shows us what it truly means to be a disciple. And that's found in verses 35 to 37. It's a paradox. Verse 34 was the requirements verses 35 to 37, offer up the reason why. 
It is a requirement to deny self, to take up your cross, and to follow Jesus. And here, by way of a paradox, we see Jesus explaining why. Jesus doesn't just say, follow me. He actually explains why. Look at the beginning of verse 35, the word for. Look at the beginning of verse 36, the word for. Beginning of verse 37, the word for. The word for for there is the word ga in the Greek. And it is the Greek word used to indicate the reasons for what has just been said. Jesus has issued the terms, and they are His terms. And now He so ever graciously explains the reasons why you need to embrace those terms. And here Jesus so masterfully gives us several reasons why. And I trust by the end of this, you will see just how absurd it is. And so ridiculous it is to fail to follow Jesus. This is an evangelistic gospel. Here's the paradox. Verse 35, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What Jesus is saying is this, is you save your life, you'll lose it. You lose your life, you'll save it. He's saying this, that if you try and hold on to your own life now by clinging to yourself and your own dreams and your own desires and your own hopes, you will not have eternal life. But if you abandon your own self, and your own desires, and lay down and surrender everything to Jesus Christ, then you will receive eternal life. If you seek to maintain ownership over your own life, and live a self-centered life, unwilling to lay aside your own life and come to Christ, as one who is bankrupt of your own spiritual resources, then Jesus is saying, this life is all you have. Understand this, when your heart stops and it will stop, you will be either ushered into an eternal life with God or you will be swept up into an eternal hell. And Jesus is saying here by way of a paradox, if you quit trying to save yourself, if you quit trying to serve yourself and all your selfish desires and all your wants and you fall at the feet of Jesus, and you thereby lose your own life by giving up your life and giving it to Him, then you will receive everlasting eternal life. And in that everlasting eternal life, you will live in the kingdom of God with all the saints and the sweet Savior forever. Jesus says there, it's for my sake and for the sake of the gospel. This is not some type of laying aside your own life like people who love to go off and live in the poor in the hills of wherever for their life and like to devote themselves to all sorts of things of that nature. No, no, you can do all those things and still end up in eternity of hell. This is for my sake and for the gospel's sake. This is supreme allegiance to a supreme Christ. The believer will abandon all for him and the gospel. The believer is the one, is he not, who finds a treasure in a field. And out of joy, he abandons his life by selling all that he has to buy that field so as to acquire that treasure. That's what the kingdom of God is like. And Jesus is saying here, the way to save your life and the way to be in possession of eternal life is to lose your life. It's been well said that there is no greater pursuit than to know Christ more fully and to love Him more deeply. And here in these verses, we see the heart of the Messiah, an evangelist, as he stands before this crowd and the twelve, and he pleads with them to come and turn away from their sin and to turn away from self and to follow him. And as a shepherd, he stands and he urges the twelve to consider afresh, and he urges you and I as those that are converted disciples, he, he urges us to consider afresh what we've done already by laying down our own life. And by submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, all in the hope that there would be greater commitment from you and I and from them. And like the master communicated of the years, 
In verse 36, he just turns up the heat. He says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? Suppose that you were able to acquire everything you so desired, a big house, brand new cars, billions of dollars, or even the entire world and all that it contains. If you lose your own soul, what does it profit you? Not a thing. Why? Because your soul is of eternal worth and nothing is more important than that. The world is of momentary worth. The world, we learn in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, is passing away. And so, your soul is the only thing that will live forever. And Jesus is placing great emphasis here on the soul. Your car, your house, your bank account, your possessions, they will all burn in just a moment, but your soul... That simply cannot be comp compared to even if you gain the whole world. And temporary is no match for eternal. And what Jesus is asking is this, would you really do it? Would you actually do it? Would you forfeit? Eternal life in the kingdom of God, where you will dwell in the new heavens and the new earth, where the earth is returned to perfection before you because of the loveliness of the Savior and His beauty and majesty. Jesus is saying, would you really do it? Would you really, for a few fleeting moments of sin, a few fleeting moments of pleasure, a lifetime of acquiring possessions, of gaining much here on earth, whether it's reputation, whatever it may be, would you really do it to the loss of your own soul? Would you do that? That's what Jesus is saying. What would it profit you if you had all those things and you lost your own soul? That would be the worst business deal in the history of mankind. There is supreme value in eternal life that far outweighs and outvalues anything this world can offer you. Your soul is worth more than the contents of the entire world. And some of you sit here unconverted. And what you're actually doing is you're actually on your way to forfeiting your own soul as you amass what the world can offer you. Verse 37, the second question from Jesus for what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. Because there is not a single thing that can compensate for your soul. Jesus is place, placing much value upon your soul, and you need to place much value upon where your soul is heading. It's worth far more than anything. And you would have to be out of your mind to lose your soul in exchange for the temporary things contained in this very temporary world. And so Jesus is calling you this moment to exchange heaven for hell for heaven. Eternal torment for eternal life. Exchange God's wrath for God's peace. Give up your own life and gain for your restless and reckless soul an eternal home where you can find rest and finally rest in Christ. So there is a high cost to following Jesus. He, he demands full allegiance and nothing less. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14 verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. 
what Jesus is saying in those two verses. He is saying that your love for Him, your devotion to Him, must far outweigh the love or devotion to anyone else in your life, even to your own life. And if it doesn't, He says, you cannot be my disciple. So we've seen the pattern that Jesus gives. We've just looked at the paradox that Jesus gave. And the very last component of these weighty words that shows us what it means to truly be a genuine disciple is a penalty in verse 38. Here it really is the rubber hitting the road of these weighty words from this evangelistic gospel, the call to put your faith in Jesus Christ and the call to commit greater and greater to Jesus Christ. Verse 38. This is why you need to be one who's following after Jesus. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If you don't flee to Christ and forsake self and forsake sin and obey Christ, you are ashamed of Christ. And to be ashamed of Christ isn't to be afraid or, or, or timid necessarily here to proclaim Christ. The word most commentators believe comes with the idea of to deny and to reject. So to be ashamed of Christ is to refuse and reject Christ. Surely to be ashamed of Christ means that you are happy to receive the accolades of this world. To be ashamed of Christ means that you are unwilling to align yourself with Him, to lose your life for Him, to suffer for Him and to follow Him. And Jesus is saying when you do that, you join in with this adulterous and sinful generation and you actually prepare yourself for the coming day. Because there is a coming day and let me tell you a little bit about that coming day that awaits the one who denies Jesus Christ. Look at the remainder of verse 38 there. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes. Wow. Jesus now ushers ahead to after the cross and at the time of His return. And He says, for all those who are ashamed of me, that is, all those who rejected me, On that day, I will be ashamed of you. All those who denied me, Jesus says, that on that coming day, when you literally beg me to pardon you, when the reality that you possessed only the riches of this world, that you realized full well that how you exchanged your soul for a lie, when the reality of the fact that self was your king, when the reality that you never followed me, when the reality that you've blown it all, when all that sets in, and when you cry out for me to help on that day, Jesus says, I will reject you. These are weighty, terrifying words. That is a terrifying end to a life that heard the truth of Jesus Christ, but chose the world and the prophet of the world. For the believer, the return of Christ is going to be joy unexplainable. (laughs) For the one who rejects Jesus Christ, the return of Christ is going to be punishment unescapable. Notice Jesus says, ashamed of me and my words. The word of God, the content of the truth of the gospel. In the glory of the Father, he says there, that the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of the Father. Listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire. 
dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day. And to be marveled that among all who have believed, He will return in the glory of the Father. Look, these are weighty words. This is a call to follow after Jesus and some radical requirements of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And many of you here have denied self. Many of you here have taken up your cross and we do so daily. And many of us here have followed Him. But there are some of you here who have never done that. And these are the weightiest words that you could ever hear, the most important words you could ever hear. And you need to understand that there is a Savior who went to the cross. And He laid down His own life. And that if you believe in Him and trust in Him and put your faith in Him, that He stood in and hung in your place, that He bore your sin, That everything that was due you fell upon Him. And that by believing in Him and trusting in Him, you are then forgiven of all your sin. But you can't just hear that. You must act upon that. That is why, behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. You have heard. You no longer act in ignorance anymore. You must Come to Jesus Christ. This moment, in this place, now. An application, very quickly as we close. Look back at the call in verse 34 from Jesus. This was the greatest evangelist that has ever set foot on the earth. And what he says here is exactly what we must model. Because we must be sharing our faith, right? Because I would submit to you, if you're not sharing your faith, you're not following Jesus. To follow me, he said, is to obey all that he has commanded. And has he not commanded the sharing of your faith? He certainly has. And so here is a model of how to share your faith. Here is a model that stands in utter contrast to the easy believism, altar call rubbish that abounds. You must call people to deny themselves, that is to turn away from their sin. You must call people to take up their cross. You will come to Jesus not for your best life now and that He is a magical genie, no, no, no. That you will follow Him down the hardest paths and the hardest roads that He calls you to go. And that you must obey what He says. That is to follow Him. Dear brothers and sisters, be faithful in your gospel proclamation. Be a good steward of the gospel that has been entrusted to you and I to proclaim. Never cheapen the cross or Christ. Call people to turn away from their sin. And to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And to follow Him in all obedience. Well, these are weighty words, are they not? Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this time. Father, what will it profit any person in this place to gain the whole world and yet to forfeit their own soul because they reject you? Would you please save the people from among the crowd, the counterfeit. Would you please save today? Would you get great glory in yourself by doing a mighty work through feeble words of your sinful servant? Would the truth of the Word of God and the Spirit of God do a mighty work and bring eternal life to anyone here who's facing eternal damnation? And for those of us, Lord, that are here, we have heard the call to follow We have forsaken self. We daily take up our cross and we daily seek to live in obedience to you. May we take these words and be reminded afresh and be committed anew to follow 
you, for you are so precious and so worthy. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.